Hello everyone, today I'm going to give a six-month update on my completed audio system in my 2022 Elantra N. I want to give an overview of everything I've installed in the car and my overall thoughts on how the system turned out. We'll begin at the front of the car with the power wire. I chose to use new concepts for most of my wiring. I like the quality of their products and their color choices that they have available. For the main power wire, I chose to go with blue to match the car. As for size, I went with zero gauge. This is a bit of overkill for my setup, but I wanted to go with zero gauge instead of four gauge in case I wanted to upgrade my system in the future. Previously, I had eight gauge installed since I was only running a Rockford Fosgate 10 inch, 300 watt powered subwoofer. I wanted to go too large of power wire instead of too small, so I didn't have to keep removing the power wire every time I wanted to upgrade my system. Also, the price difference between 4 gauge and 0 gauge wasn't much. When I had the 8 gauge power wire installed, I was able to slide it through the back side of the factory positive wire housing. With the 0 gauge, it was simply too large to do that. So, as you can see, I had to use a Dremel and cut a half circle in the factory positive wire cover. I installed an a &L style of fuse holder due to the higher fuse my system required. Based on the maximum power output of my amplifiers, I needed a 183 amp fuse. This size was not available, so I went with the closest size, which was a 200 amp fuse. Again, this gave me a bit of room to add more power to the system without having to change much in the way of wiring components. Due to the length of the car, I ended up running approximately 16 feet of power wire to the trunk. Once in the trunk, the power wire goes into a mini a &L fuse distribution block. I used a 60 amp fuse for my 600 watt mono subwoofer amplifier and a 120 amp fuse for my 1200 watt six channel amplifier. For the main ground wire, I drilled into the wheel well and installed a large bolt that allowed me to create a nice solid ground, easily able to handle the zero gauge wires terminal. I ran the main ground into the same style of distribution block used for the power wire, except this one had solid bars instead of fuses. For my amplifiers, I chose to go with an Alpine SA60M mono amplifier. This provides 600 watts of power at 2 ohms to a 12-inch Kicker Comp R subwoofer. The Kicker sub is 2 ohms and rated to handle 500 watts RMS of power. I like to give my sub a bit more power than it's rated, rather than less power. This was a noticeable upgrade over my previous Rockford Fosgate 10-inch powered subwoofer. There was nothing wrong with that sub, it was great, I just wanted a bit more bass which this new setup provides. The bass of the kicker sub is louder and has a deeper tone due to the increased power and ported box versus the sealed box of the Rockford sub. As for my front, rear, and center speakers, I chose to go with Audio Control's LC 6.1200 6 channel amplifier. This amplifier is sending 120 watts to each front, rear, and center speaker. I chose this amplifier over other brands because I like their line level processing. With my previous powered subwoofer, I used Audio Control's LC2i and really liked how the line level converter helps to integrate the amplifier with my factory system. So when looking for an amplifier, I chose to go with Audio Control's amp because the same line level converter is built into their amps. It also has the ability to control other amplifiers such as a sub amp. Here is a close-up of the main audio control amplifier. Your setup will probably differ from mine, but in case anyone wants to see what I did, here you go. Channels 1 and 2 are for my front speakers, 3 and 4 are for my rear speakers, and channel 5 is for my center speaker. The center speaker is a Dayton 3-inch mid-range. The rear speakers are the factory 6 and halfs, and the front speakers are Focal Flax components. The Dayton Center is a great speaker to use. It's a low-cost option that sounds great. It's rated at 15 watts, but has worked wonderfully with the 125 watts I'm sending it. It blends well with my Focal front speakers. I chose to keep the factory rear speakers because they sound fine for rear fill. I wanted my main focus to be on the front stage. If you have passengers and want a bit more highs for them, then I would suggest replacing the rear speakers. Otherwise, I would put some sound dentoning in the rear doors and call it a day. I built my system one piece at a time for two reasons. One, to be able to show how to add each piece in my videos, and two, to reduce upfront cost. Going this route, I was able to buy each piece but still maintain a working system.
Getting back to the wiring, since I wanted to show off my wiring, I decided against hiding the wire. Instead, I used zip tie mounts to be able to keep the wires visible, but installed in a clean way. Also, I chose to go with purple and green for my power and ground wires to add something different when showing off my car at car shows versus the normal red and black or blue and black. The RCAs I used were New Concepts Crystal Cables. These are New Concepts higher tier RCA cables. Even with them being at the higher end of their cable lineup, the cost of the cables were very reasonable. And by reasonable, I mean they were approximately $4 more than the next tier down. Behind the amplifiers, I have an audio control DM608 DSP processor. This unit handles all of my crossovers, time delay, gain correction, and 30 band EQ processing. The processor can be set with a laptop via USB cable. I've kept the cable permanently installed in the unit and hidden in between my back seats. This way, I can easily hook up the laptop anytime I need to make changes to the system. Since I initially set up the system, I've not needed to do much in the way of making corrections to the system since I've not changed any of the speakers or amplifier after the DSP was installed. To get a remote turn on, signal to the DSP, and power to the factory speaker locations, I tapped into the factory Bose amplifier. I purchased 10 different colored rolls of 18 gauge wire that matched most of the factory colors. This can be easily reversed by unplugging the wires going to my processor and amp and plugging the factory wires back together. The wires are held together neatly with Tessa tape. I chose this method over trying to make an optical converter work because initially I didn't have the processor to accept the optical signal and I wanted to maintain the volume control and chime functions. The remote turn on is routed to the DSP and then out of the DSP to the amplifiers. The signal wires go to the DSP as well while the speaker wires are ran to the six channel amplifier. The DSP has an optional volume control knob called the ACR3. This is a multifunctional control knob. I have it set as a sub volume control only. I originally had it installed on top of the fuse cover, but recently moved it under the USB plugs. There was nothing wrong with where it was. I just thought the new location looked nicer. It was easy to do since I had extra slack already under the dash. I wrapped the wire in Tessa tape to hide its gray color and make it disappear with the dash. The knob is held into place with double-sided tape. I use a short lightning cable to plug into my phone for CarPlay use. I do this to get the best possible sound over Bluetooth. My phone is held into place with a Tesla-style magnetic phone mount, which works great. I have a video going over how to choose a car mount for the Elantra. A link to that video will be in the description below. The trunk's false floor has small risers so some of the wiring can sit properly under the wood top. Also, they allow for an anchor point for the wood top. I used cardboard to make templates for the false floor pieces. The main two pieces are squares with two small winglets. The front section has a large area cut out to allow for a piece of Lexan to set into the wood. The Lexan section and winglets are painted black while the rear piece is unpainted because it's not visible in any way. The Lexan lets people view my amplifiers and wiring when I'm at car shows. I installed LED lights on the underside of the wood panel around the Lexan window and on the rear deck of the trunk. This really lights up the whole trunk from a below and above. The Lexan section is held into place with double-sided tape. This was done because I didn't want to drill into the Lexan. The tape works great and gives a black border to the inside of the Lexan, hiding the wood. I mounted the LED tube's control box on the underside of the rear deck. This is hidden by the subwoofer and gives me quick access to the wires if I have any issues. The LEDs came with a remote control that allows me to change the color or movement of the lights. The trunk is completely sound deadened throughout the bottom section, the trunk cover, tail lights, and rear deck both top and bottom. This helps to reduce any rattles in the trunk and helps to increase the base with inside the car. When the false floor was completed, I topped it off by placing the factory double-sided rubber carpet trunk mat back in the trunk and then cutting out a section above the piece of Lexan. I was able to cut this section out cleanly, allowing me to use the cover for the Lexan when I needed to put items in the trunk. When this section is placed over the Lexan, it's hard to tell that the carpet has even been cut. I really like how it turned out.
To get power to the subwoofer, I use New Concepts Karma 12 gauge speaker wire. The wire is thick because the positive and negative wire are both housed together in the same sleeve. I purchased black wire boots to give a clean look at each end of the wire. To hold the subwoofer in place, I installed a large Velcro strap commonly used to hold extension cords together. This strap is attached to the back of the subwoofer and then looped around the trunk's red brace. This makes removing the subwoofer easy if I ever need extra room in the trunk. Here's where I keep the USB cable for the DSP. It's easily accessible in between the rear seats. Speaking of the DSP, here's a look at the different screens of the DSP. When you first open Audio Controls program, you will see the input screen. This screen will allow you to change the input gain and see the incoming signal on the large RTA at the bottom of the screen. I chose to increase my input by three decibels. This was due to the fact that the factory system's volume seems to be set where you're forced to turn it up to a high level just to get volume out of it. Even with this amount of increase to the input, I still tend to listen to the system at around 57 to 63. 63 would be the max I generally listen to the system. It can go louder, but that seems to be a good volume even with the windows down. I'm not showing the RTA since I'm not running any signal. I didn't want to have any copyright issues by playing music. The next screen is the output view. This screen allows you to make corrections to the signal going out to the speakers. You can make changes such as channel summing, crossover points, time delay, bass restoration, and EQ settings. Each channel allows you to make changes to each speaker separately. I have channels 1 and 2 set for my front speakers. Each speaker is EQ'd differently. Channels 5 and 6 are my rear speakers. I found EQing them together worked fine. Channel 7 is my center and channel 8 is my sub. Both of these channels only had one speaker to EQ. You'll also see remote control volume on the screen. This allows you to configure what you want the ACR3 control knob to adjust. I have it set to simply adjust the volume of the subwoofer. You can save up to four memory files. You can change to a different memory file using the ACR3. This would be helpful if you wanted to set a system to be focused on the driver, then another file to be set, uh, focused on the pas passengers, and finally a file for maximum SPL. It provides added flexibility to your system. I have all the memory set to the same file in case I accidentally change a file on the ACR3. Now for the EQ. You have a few choices regarding the EQ. The EQ can be set as a parametric EQ or graphic EQ. I chose to use the 30 band graphic EQ option. The first step would be to run the auto EQ function about three or four times. This is not what you'll use to EQ your car it's simply trying to do the best it can to correct the factory signal and giving you the flattest signal to begin tuning with. After you run the auto EQ, you may see the EQ all over the place. But again, this is what the software sees that needs to be done to correct the factory tune. To properly tune the EQ, you will have to have an RTA with a microphone. The least expensive and easiest option that I found was Audio Control's SA4100i. This is a microphone that plugs into your iPhone or iPad and comes with a free downloadable app. Once you have the microphone, you'll want to place it where your head will be and begin tuning. You'll need to decide on a curve that you want to achieve and begin tuning the system. Here are my EQ screens. Keep in mind, yours will look different based on the speakers you choose and the curve you're trying to achieve. I'm showing these screens just as an example. Finally, you have a dashboard view. This view shows you an overview of the input and output screens of each channel. Under the signal summing, you'll see the level for each channel. This allows you to make changes to each channel. After you set the gain of each amp, you can then go to the level bar and make changes to get the speaker level set the same. This is especially helpful when you're trying to match the level of the center channel to the front speakers. My front speakers were the main focus, and I set the level of the other speakers to match the front and not overshadow the front speakers. Looking at my subwoofer's dashboard screen, you can see that the remote volume is set to level with the output configuration set to link seven. This tells the ACR3 that I want it to only control the volume of the subwoofer. If you're only installing entry level speakers, I would say a DSP wouldn't be necessary. But if you're upgrading to speakers such as the Focal Evos as I did, 
I would say a DSP is necessary. When I first listened to the Evos over the Focal speakers I had previously had installed in the car, I was very disappointed. The tweeters sounded shrill and the mid-range didn't really sound any better than the less expensive speakers that I was replacing. After tuning with the DSP, the speaker's sound was a night and day difference. I could tell a huge difference versus the previous speakers. So if you're going to install higher end speakers and put them on a separate amp, I would say invest in a DSP and you won't be disappointed. A DSP adds extra cost and there is a bit of a learning curve to setting it up, but it will pay off in the sound that you can achieve. Some people have asked about replacing the 8 inch factory subwoofer. This is definitely an option, but you will need to make your own mounting plate and you will need to be sure you're sound deadening the rear deck thoroughly. Plus, I would highly recommend adding a foam ring around the subwoofer that touches the plastic rear deck cover. This will further help with vibration. Finally, I would suggest adding a separate amplifier for the sub. You can run a new sub off the factory amp, but it won't provide as noticeable an upgrade versus adding a separate amplifier. Overall, I love how the system turned out. It looks clean and simple, which is exactly the look I was going for. Plus, it sounds great. The highs are crisp and clean at any volume level, and the subwoofer is strong without drowning out my highs. If you're unhappy with the factory Bose system like I was, I would highly recommend upgrading the sound system. You don't have to go to the extreme I went to get better sound. You can always start by adding a powered sub for the better bass and upgrading the center and front speakers and run them off the factory amp. This would be a good start to better sound. If you have any questions or need help with your install, please leave a comment or reach out to me directly. I check my comments daily in an effort to answer questions quickly. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more content.